Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alexandre Net from EDP New, and I would like to welcome to, to our ninth uh, R&D session. Today's session is about hydrogen. We call it hydrogen as the missing element on the energy transition, pun intended. And, um, and uh, so uh, I'm very happy to, to have you here. Uh, I'll leave uh, very soon uh, the, the floor to, to my colleagues that will present you them today's uh, agenda. But I just wanted to, to say that this is the, the ninth uh, session. We have had sessions about smart cities, about smart grids, about the, the need for flexibility in the electric system, about data and algorithms, robotics. So we have uh, had a lot of fun and uh, knowledge sharing uh, and uh, we will continue that in the um, next session. We still uh, haven't confirmed the, the date. It will be in two or probably in three weeks from now, and it will be about uh, ocean energy and focus on, on uh, two H 2020 projects, which are DT Ocean Plus and Sea Titan. So stay tuned, but uh, still today, I will leave the floor to, to my colleague Nun Philippe, also from EDP New which is the, um, the head of uh, the RES integration and flexibility team of EDP New, and he will present you the, the, the session and uh, how, how it's going to, to be. No, no, feel free. Thank you, Alexander. So uh, a very warm welcome to all of you that are on the other side of the screen. Uh, welcome and thank you for, for being there. Uh, so what I bring today is one of the hottest topics of the energy sector right now. So we have hydrogen has the missing link or element of the energy transition. Uh, this um, presentation, this webinar will be divided into two main parts. The first one will focus in one of our most important projects, Flex and Kofu which will install in the Ribatej power plant uh, electrolyzer of one megawatt. And the second part will be dedicated to a round table um, with the topic of hydrogen off takers and users. But before all of that, I will do a short introduction for the topic and explain you why we are talking about hydrogen. So you already seen uh, these slides uh, many times in the, the different webinars. The ADP New is organized by the five knowledge areas uh, which represent the innovation pillars for EDP group and also the innovation pillars of the, the energy transition. Uh, this hydrogen topic is inside the has integration and flexibility area which has also other topics of interest, namely storage, grid integration and market and regulation. But we have uh, for the past month dedicated a lot of time of our projects and initiatives on this green hydrogen topic. In terms of uh, projects portfolio, we have uh, currently five active projects. So uh, CISFLEX, EU CISFLEX, and XFlex dedicated to flexibility and the, the, that the need for that flexibility to allow the integration of more renewables. We also have Flex and Kung Fu and beyond the two projects on hydrogen and uh, the, a project that is called Janusz that began um, like one month ago. And this is a big project that the EDP New coordinates and has the overall objective of decarbonizing a geographical islands with a very important uh, um, demo in Tercera Island. But we also have two more projects that will come live uh, in January that deal with storage. That they are called Lollabat and Current Direct. So, but let's talk about uh, the main topics that bring us here today. So uh, EDP throughout the years uh, that uh, it operates, it has been pushing and pushing for electrification of the different uses. 
being that on the residential side, industry or transport. But uh, for the past years, we saw and we realized that uh, there is there was something missing because we could not electrify everything. So hydrogen comes has a, a good solution, the missing piece or the missing link that could really uh, contribute for the decarbonization of those hard to abact sectors, namely industry. And we have a lot of industries, many industries where we could use uh, hydrogen as a feedstock or directly burning and also heavy duty transport. But uh, hydrogen also is a way to empower renewables and allowing further integration of uh, these uh, variable uh, energy, renewable energy sources. And has a third possibility, it also provides a storage namely seasonal storage, so long term storage and is a good source of flexibility because if we look at an electrolyzer, it has the possibility to provide demand side response. And uh, this is something that uh, if we look at our ancillary services market, uh, they are changing and evolving in order to introduce this as a possibility of um, flexibility and possibility to uh, be on the, on those markets. Sorry. Now focusing on the goals and objectives for uh, the uh, European Union and Portugal. So uh, two strategies were launched, the European one and also the Portuguese one and other countries followed the same approach and we have very ambitious uh, targets for uh, at European level and also uh, Portuguese level. For European level, we want to have 13 uh, to 14 percent of hydrogen on the energy mix by 2050. We also want to create 1 million jobs and to target 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer by 2030. Of those 40 gigawatts, we want for to have 2 to 2.5 in Portugal by that time and achieving 5 gigawatts by 2040 and have an investment around 7 billion to 9 billion on this new economy. If we look at the value chain, so hydrogen is a, uh, is a perfect solution, a very good solution because it links the power sector with the gas sector through the buzzword that we call uh, sector coupling. So this is, if we look at this value chain, it has a lot of elements uh, across it. But beginning at the, your left, we could, so, we could see the energy sourcing. We want to promote the hydrogen, the green hydrogen, so the one that is produced by renewables. Then on the production side, we have the crucial element that is the electrolyzer, and we also need storage. On the transport and distribution, we could have different options from the pipeline to the road transport and also uh, export through the sea. If we focus now on the end user side, so we could have injection into the natural gas network. We also could have industry use it as a feedstock, transport and power generation. And it's good to see that this webinar covers uh, these four main points. So we will talk about power generation, so power to X to power on the Flex and Kung Fu project that will be presented next. And the other three on the on the top will be discussed on our uh, roundtable. Uh, EDP now looking at EDP uh, scope and positioning on this hydrogen uh, sector. So EDP has been positioning throughout different uh, innovative and pioneer projects and initiatives. There are more than this that I have here. But I just want to briefly uh, talk a little bit about them. So we have the big one at the left, that is the H2 Singe project, where we want to create a national industry cluster that throughout different phases want to achieve one gigawatt by 2030 
and on that produce hydrogen to use locally at national level, but also create export and uh, export route to the north of Europe. So um, in the scope of this big uh, H2 Synch project, we also um, uh, we also developed a proposal for uh, a collab, so a collaborative laboratory just dedicated to green hydrogen. This collab that wants to be a reference at national and European level gathers not only the industry but also the academia and also many relevant stakeholders at national level uh, in order to be a reference and to support not only the H2 Sins project but also the project from Bondalti in Stagaja but also uh, to be have a public purpose and to help to promote the H2 economy at national and European level. This proposal was submitted at the 7th of September and now we are waiting for the evaluation results. We expect to if approved to have the collab by next year. The third one uh, is the Beyond project that I mentioned before and wants to do a feasibility study where uh, we will study how the hydrogen could be produced offshore and linked to uh, offshore wind parks. This will be a very important topic in the future. And the last uh, and very important, the Flex and Kofu project. Now that I finished my part, um, I will just briefly refer what will be the structure that will follow here for the first part of this webinar. So, uh, Paul Kessler from our side, the DPNU, will provide a project overview of Flex and Kofu. Then, Paula Ramos from NDP Produção we'll talk about in detail uh, uh, the Ribatejo demo, where we installed the electrolyzer, and then Leopoldo from uh, Hydrogen Cummins will talk about the technology that will be installed there and also provide an overview over their technological roadmap. Uh, very important, and before passing the word to Paul, please ask questions. Um, put the questions on the, the chat because we'll have a dedicated time uh, to after the end of these three presentations to answer your questions. Thank you all and uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon everyone. My name is Paul Kessler and I'm the project manager of the Flex and Confu project from EDP News Point. Um, here, the, the main goal of the project is basically to, to flexibilize uh, conventional power plants based on integrating a power to X solution based on renewable energies. Um, and for that, I will uh, now introduce you to the, let's say, sub objectives of the project, which are basically orientated on in, in four basic pillars. The first one would be that the project will design, develop and test an innovative gas turbine combustion system that is actually able to burn hydrogen and ammonia mixtures with natural gas. Um, secondly, this um, uh, project will also demonstrate um, how both options, so the power to hydrogen and power to ammonia system, will work um, at the laboratory environment, but also in the real environment at the Ribatejo power plant. Um, and lastly, to conclude, um, the project will also develop novel control algorithms to basically allow for an optimal steering of the combined process. So looking at the conventional power plants um, constraints and also the constraints of the power to X process to um, basically find an opti optimal control hierarchy and also to provide, for example, grid balancing services. The overall project uh, is assembled of 21 partners from over 10 different um, European countries. Um, the project uh, has an overall budget of 12 million euros, um, whereas the European Commission provided almost 10 million euros of that funding. The EDP Cosmos that is basically working in this project that is uh, assembled of EDP Produção as the lead partner and EDP New as, as a supporting partner um, comprises 1.7 million euros in funding. 
um, and the project is coordinated by RINA Consulting, an Italian entity, and has some further core technology partners, for example, Hydrogenics, um, with Cummins on board as well today in this call, um, Angie Laborlec, um, and also CEA from, from France. Um, following this, I will now present you, sorry, the slides are not moving. Sorry for this delay. Exactly. Um, what is basically in it for EDP? Um, so what is EDP's role in the project and what are the key outputs of EDP? Um, EDP Plurusau, as I said, will be the lead partner uh, in the demonstration activities, demonstrating the power to hydrogen concept at the Ribatejo power plant. EDP New will support basically the integration of the power to hydrogen process into the conventional power plants process uh, in terms of the layout optimization. And EDP New will also further focus on the assessment um, of other viable offtake options of the hydrogen. So, for example, mobility and transport application. Um, and also facilitate the replication to really promote, as Nuno mentioned in the introduction, uh, this new hydrogen soci society in Portugal and beyond in Europe. Um, one of the core outputs for EDP is really that the Flex and Confu project will, will offer a solution to repurpose conventional power plants um, and to basically respond to the future needs of the, of the energy system, which will basically facilitate that we, we will have a more smarter a secure and more resilient power system. As EDP is also the operator of such system, it is one of the core um, uh, areas of interest of the company. Further, it will also allow to basically um, smoother operate conventional power plants as power to x process bring an additional source of flexibility to the plant and a source of storage. More Moreover, on the next slide, um, we will see a bit the, the context um, of the project, um, which is basically um, driven by the need for, for deploying more and more renewables uh, to the energy system, um, which basically uh, brings existing conventional plans or compels them to become more flexible while also decarbonizing. So we have this, uh, this, this dual challenge of, of flexibilizing power, conventional power plants and making them more sustainable. And one possible answer to do so, as Nuno also said in the beginning, is to basically integrate uh, innovative power to X process uh, with the conventional power plant and uh, re or basically use renewable energy as a base to produce a carbon free fuel via the power to x process and reuse or re-inject that fuel in the conventional power plant uh, by burning it and producing decarbonized electricity. However, um, this potential answer or possible answer comes with uh, certain challenges that need to be addressed. On the one side, um, the combustion process of conventional power plants needs to be uh, adapted and matured to basically allow for burning hydrogen and natural gas mixtures or ammonia and natural gas mixtures. Moreover, when we are speaking uh, about hydrogen in particular, most of the time we also need to consider specific safety related issues due to the storage and compression of this um, highly fluid uh, uh, gas. Um, aside from that, um, as this is a new, completely new area and field of integrating such a solution, we also need uh, novel control strategies, and as there's no, let's say, research on this part um, of the coin, the project or potential projects need to investigate this. Overall, um, and this is also one of the, the, the biggest barriers that we, we see hydrogen not in the market, are, are basically the, the, the transparency and comparability of the costs associated with the, with the, um, with the technology. And on the next slide, we can see how Flex and Confu is basically particularly addressing those specific challenges 
uh, and make those challenges basically core pillars of the project. So regarding having in mind to, to adapt the conventional combustion process, the first pillar of the Flex and Confu project is basically to investigate the use of non-conventional fuel mixtures in microgas and gas turbines to basically um, flexibilize and decarbonize the process. The second pillar will focus more on actually integrating uh, and demonstrating such a novel power to X system in a real power plant, uh, considering an optimized and scalable layout to basically also apply this concept in other power plants and not only in the Ribatejo power plant. The third pillar would then solely focus and target to develop new grid oriented uh, con control strategies that will basically um, consider the process as a whole. So again, the conventional power plant and the, the power to X process. And then the fourth pillar, one of the core pillars is really to promote a hydrogen and even ammonia energy society in Europe. For that, uh, on the next slide, you can basically see, and I want to detail a bit, the main technology that uh, the Flex and Control project relies on. So on the first part, we have the power to hydrogen process, and my colleague Paula Ramos will, will detail this further on, so I won't focus too much on this one, but let me maybe um, have a detailed look at the second one, the power to ammonia process, where we can see that it's um, basically one cycle. We see that uh, through um, the grid um, and the injection of water, we are producing uh, hydrogen, hydrogen based on the power to X process, which is resembled by water electrolysis. Um, in this case, it's a PEM electrolyzer. And this hydrogen will then be injected in an uh, ammonia synthesis process, uh, which will basically um, synthesize the input hydrogen from the electrolyzer with the nitrogen from the atmosphere and basically uh, produce ammonia that can be used and will be injected um, in a mix with natural gas into a microgas turbine and burned to provide electricity. Um, on the next slide, um, you will see um, that the overall scope of the Flex and Control project is not only limited to one demonstration site, but that it's basically covering four levels of abstraction uh, in terms of the demonstration uh, to basically uh, cover and showcase um, Flex and Control's contributions to each of the pillars. So each of the demonstration activities are, are aligned with the project pillars. So in the first one, you can see that the initial demo focuses on the gas turbine combustion here in in the, in Cardiff's uh, laboratories, um, the project will investigate the optimal mixtures of hydrogen and natural gas, and also ammonia and uh, natural gas to basically um, establish a reliable and uh, and secure um, combustion process. This knowledge will then be injected into the second layer of abstraction. Uh, of the demonstration activities at the Savona laboratory and at the Ribatejo power plant, where the actual uh, two technologies will be integrated and the knowledge gained in the first step will be applied actually in the two processes. Con in conclusion of that, you can see also, sorry Nuno, one, one step back, we can see that the last part of the demo activities is basically concluded with a with a virtual demonstrator um, at Angie's labs, where an advanced grid oriented control strategy will basically be developed and derived from the operational results that come from point two and three on this slide. And now we can take a little peek into the future where Flex and Confu uh, wants to go and what Flex and Confu uh, targets. So the project has basically established um, quite an extensive development roadmap, which you can see here. So the project will start in 2020, so in the beginning of 2020, and will be concluded uh, at the, the end of 2024 um, at TRL 7, which basically means that the technology was demonstrated in an operational environment. And then what is basically the next step to release it to the market. And there Flex and Confu provides already an outlook 
um, which specific other end uses could this concept be applied to and what is the replication potential here and once those steps are taken we will most likely see this flex and control pro, uh, concept um, established in other regions in Europe which you can see here on this uh, small lab we've the, the, the project has already identified core regions where this concept could be replicated, for example, Spain, uh, Germany, but also Poland. And I think um, I'm now at the end of my, my, my short uh, presentation. If you have um, any further questions, maybe also in the aftermath of this presentation, uh, feel free to reach out to me to contact the project, uh, to follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. And my colleague Paula Ramos will now focus uh, a bit more on the technological concept uh, of the Flex and Control project that will be um, applied at the Ribatejo power plant. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm uh, Paula Ramos and uh, I'm project manager of the Flex and Control project from EDP uh, Produção. Uh, first, uh, a few words of our role in the in the project. Uh, EDP Produção uh, is the leader of uh, Work Package 5, responsible for the demonstration uh, of a power to hydrogen to power, uh, where I will focus uh, my presentation. Um, but um, but in this project, EDP Produção is also involved in many other activities leading uh, five tasks and participating in 27 tasks in a total of 39 tasks of the project, such as evaluation of the impacts on the design of combustion chamber, burning uh, hydrogen, investigation of uh, other uses of hydrogen and oxygen to enhance the system profitability, and uh, among the others, uh, it is represented also in the steering and demo committees of the project. So next slide, please. So the, the, the main goal of the Flex and Confu uh, project is to develop and demonstrate at the TRL7 uh, in a full-scale combined cycle power plant, the solution power to hydrogen to power. A complete system composed by one megawatt fast cycle uh, electrolyzer, PEM technology, uh, gas compressor and pressurized hydrogen storage will be installed and integrated in the Ribatejo combined cycle power plant. The concept is to convert the surplus energy from the grid into hydrogen via an electrolyzer and use the produced hydrogen in the power plant combustion process replacing the carbon intensive uh, natural gas in times when renewables cannot satisfy the energy demand. The power plant comprises three similar and independent units, each one of 392 uh, megawatts burning natural gas, and the unit is in operation since 2004. Next slide, please. So the work package five uh, is dedicated to the development and implementation of the power to hydrogen uh, demonstration plant and comprises six tasks. Uh, the first task is more related with the design of the balance of the plant and the integration of the demo plant in the Rivetejo power plant. Uh, the second uh, will be um, led by uh, Hydrogenix, now Cummings, and uh, Ichi Kaldai. And uh, where in this task, all the design, the, the, the procurement, the construction, the assembling of the electrolyzer and the compressor and storage system will be uh, developed. Um, task uh, 5.3 address all the questions regarding health and safety aspects, risk assessment, as it is of analysis, and will be led by our coordinator, uh, Rina, and we'll have uh, the, also the inputs of, from NLAB NG. Um, the task 5.4, led by uh, MAS, uh, is dedicated to the detailed engineering and control system implementation at demonstration level 
task five, five um, uh, will be uh, dedicated to the, of course, the construction, installation, old commissioning and tests and training, startup of the demonstration plant. And the task 5.6 is entirely dedicated to the operation and demonstration of the power to hydrogen system integrated, fully integrated in the, our combined cycle power plant. So with a total duration of 48 months, the project has started on the 1st of April uh, of this year and uh, is in development phase until the end of uh, 2021. Uh, the construction, the commission and tests will be done during 2022 and the demonstration plan will be ready in operation at the end of March 2023, um, if not before. Uh, the last year will be dedicated to the operation and the demonstration. So next slide, please. So the main objectives of the demo plant is to evaluate the gas turbine compatibility, uh, burning other fuels, explore the energy storage concept through the hydrogen uh, as a, a carrier. So uh, we transform the uh, electricity in a, a, a molecular, uh, storage this molecular, and then we uh, burn again the, the, the hydrogen to produce again uh, energy. Uh, explore the um, evaluated the benefits in terms of wear and tear uh, reduction, efficiencies and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions. It will be injected 1% of hydrogen, uh, which is about uh, at uh, maximum load six, six, 65 uh, kilograms per hour of hydrogen. So no major quantified gains uh, will be achievable, but they will be used to extrapolate uh, the overall gains expected in a large scale uh, hydrogen injection plant. Uh, the system will be tested and analyzed at several loads and power ramps uh, with the aim of characterizing the all operational um, uh, envelope and understanding the, the plant limits. Uh, we are going to collect all the operational parameters like the overall efficiencies, load variation times, which will be set off as a design based parameters for scale up. GDP can gain much experience in the hydrogen production and it is expected to achieve 1000 hours testing uh, and produce uh, uh, about 88 tons of hydrogen. So, uh, please, next slide. <laughs> so, as uh, we are in the phase of the, the project development, there are four main aspects that we have to, to look at and uh, we have addressed. One is the site, uh, the site constraints, the, the space uh, availability, which is always challenging in the retrofits. Uh, not even not only for the, the, the pilot, but also for the, the, the bigger the bigger plants, uh, and uh, because uh, this space in the combined cycle power plants are usually very compact power plants. Uh, the technical aspects, uh, uh, namely the gas turbine assessment, is critical. So using hydrogen in gas turbines, what are the percentage of hydrogen that we can uh, inject, what are the modifications in gas turbines. Uh, we have to look at the NOx emissions, the flame stability. Uh, so all these aspects should be addressed. Uh, electrolyzer and the compression and storage system. So this is the technology, of course, the size, the technology, the maturity of the technology, alkaline, PEM and so on. So there are key factors. Uh, and the balance of plant assessment and management uh, of all the interfaces with the existing plant. Uh, so the analysis of the all the battery limits between the power plant and the new systems, uh, water, nitrogen, cooling water, compressor, hair, firefighting, drains, and so on. So everything should be looked for and should be um, addressed. Uh, uh, of course, uh, assessment of the safety requirements to fulfill the standards uh, and the rules are mandatory. It should, it should be looked for a national uh, um, 
regulations, but uh, if there is no specific regulations in the country, uh, we have to follow more strict rules from Europe. Uh, and the ATEC study is mandatory as well as risk assessment and as it has of analysis of the overall system. From regulatory, uh, all licenses and permits uh, required uh, before the implementation, like the environmental uh, and the authorizations. And uh, during the execution, also, we have several uh, authorizations and licenses and permits that we need to address, uh, namely for the construction, namely for the preservation, namely for the low voltage projects and the pipefighting project that should be approved. And also, all the system, all the power to H system integrated in the power plant have to be certified. Um, in Rivetej, we have already started to, to do these diligences uh, with, with the HEP and the uh, check. So next slide, please. Regarding the, the gas turbine, I would like to address here uh, this aspect. Uh, we, we did an assessment. The assessment has been done uh, a benchmark towards the main uh, original manufacturers and all have that below 5% of hydrogen, no technical modifications in uh, gas turbines are required. So uh, hydrogen uh, flow analyzer, engineering and control system integration measures are necessary. Um, between uh, 5% and 15% of hydrogen injection, for instance, in case of uh, 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 gas turbines of the Siemens, that, which is the case of uh, Ribatejo, uh, this requires the replacement of uh, uh, gas turbine burners uh, and the installation of uh, uh, hydrogen flow analyzer. Uh, engineering, uh, uh, engineering and uh, system integration also have to be modified. Um, other, other gas turbines, uh, like from uh, GE, Mitsubishi or Ansaldo, have different gas turbines and the technical modifications is more related with the gas sensor and valves, ventilation and combustion control. Uh, but between 15% and 30% of uh, hydrogen injection, so major intervention in gas turbines are required with several millions uh, involved. So, uh, for this, in the case of the Siemens, uh, they need to develop and test in new burners. In case of GE and the Mitsubishi and the South requires also modifications in the multi nozzle combustor and the bottom, bottoming cycle. And above 30% of uh, hydrogen injection, all, um, all manufacturers are uh, developing the new gas burner, so there is no commercial available uh, uh, at now. <coughs> so please. So here is our uh, process uh, flow diagram, uh, almost uh, finished. We are finishing also the, the mass balance. Uh, uh, we are going to inject, as uh, I have, 1% uh, uh, of hydrogen blended in the gas that feeds the, the pipe to, to gas turbine of unit 2 in a Ribatejo power plant. Um, here, indeed, in real, our consumption, it will be 1.44 megawatts, not 1 megawatt, and we are going to produce 22.7 kilograms per hour of hydrogen. Uh, the hydrogen is then uh, pressurized, so they left the electrolyzer at 30 bars. Uh, the, he, is, he is pressurized uh, at uh, 20 bars and store in a battery of the gas bottles or tube trailer. This is under uh, discussion and uh, development. Um, we expect to store uh, 40 kilos of hydrogen. Uh, from the BOP side, uh, electrolyzer will be feed from uh, our water treatment plant uh, with uh, demineralized water. 
and uh, uh, we also uh, have uh, uh, nitrogen for purging the system and also to some control uh, valves of the control uh, system of the uh, uh, compressor and uh, injection. Um, so, uh, as uh, as we can we can if we we can pass to the to the other slide, please. Okay, here is uh, uh, is the, the, the our our layout. Our this is the plant of Ribatejo. Choosing the best location. This means that not only space available, uh, but uh, space should be in full compliance with uh, the with safety requirements, namely respecting the, the distance uh, from the neighborhood uh, um, facilities. Otherwise, uh, some additional protections have to be included, uh, uh, for example, walls or even con concrete walls, depending on the situation, uh, to respect the strict uh, and safety rules from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from standards, from an FPA. Um, in the layout here, uh, you can see uh, from the, I, I don't have the, the command, but <laughs> Uh, here on the the, the, the right side, uh, the first container is is our is the transformer, uh, and then the, we have the electrical uh, cabinet from HDP and the control cabinet uh, where it will be installed the SCADA system, which control all the power to hydrogen uh, demo plants. Then we have the the, the first container of uh, 40 40 feet. Uh, that uh, is the, the, the power container that feeds the electrolyzer uh, from hydrogen X. And uh, the, the second container is the container uh, of the electrolyzer, which includes all the, the components such uh, hydrogen production, the stack modules, the, uh, the hydrogen purification system, the water polishing. Um, the last container of 40 feet also. It will be uh, installed the, 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 the gas compressor and, um, and the, the buffer tank. So here is the, the, the section uh, dedicated to the, the storage of the, the, the hydrogen. Uh, it will be the, it will, we need only a, a roof and uh, we will store uh, gas bottles, or if we have a trailer, we have also space to put a tube trailer uh, uh, there. It, this is in a uh, old, but as you can see, uh, we are, uh, we need some, uh, to put this uh, pilot plant, we need uh, a space uh, of around 400 uh, square meters uh, for the complete plant. And the electrolyzer uh, occupies uh, an area of 75 uh, uh, square meters, uh, which we estimate it is almost 50 square meters per megawatt of electrolyzer. Uh, so uh, this is our uh, our plant. We are uh, we are uh, in the in the in in the middle of the developing uh, this uh, system, but uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, to the audience and also I would like to thank to EDP team involved in this uh, project. This is a multidisciplinary team uh, with engineering from uh, DOT, HIT, uh, APS, DST, DRN and IEN. And I would like also to, uh, to address and to thank to the team of the João Andrade and Timothy from support given so far from the uh, Ribatejo power plant. Hello, good evening. My name is Leopoldo Borghete and I will be talking specifically about the electrolyzer that has been installed at Plex and Kung Fu, as well as talking about our product portfolio at Cummins. And then I will talk about our technology roadmap. So um, to begin with, um, many of you might not be familiarized with Cummins, so I will begin by speaking about my company. 
So I represent Cummins as a business development manager within the, organi the hydrogen organization of the new power business unit. So Cummins is a company with a more, it's more than 100 years old. It is based out of Columbus, Indiana, and we have a presence over 190 countries. We're mainly known for manufacturing diesel engines for on highway, off highway applications and for power generation. But since 2017, Cummins has been investing in alternative technologies and has made several key acquisitions, at JVs and memorandum of understanding to expand our product portfolio. So that involves uh, producing batteries uh, for on and off highway vehicles and as well as producing uh, hydrogen through electrolyzers and the manufacturing of fuel cells. So in total, uh, we invested one billion last year in research and technology, and we will be continuing to invest uh, in our capabilities to continue to bring these products to market. So in terms of our capabilities within hydrogen, um, I Cummins and our relationship with the Flex and Config project as Cummins it comes through the acquisition of Hydrogenics, which was a company that we began acquiring in September of 2019. Hydrogenics manufactures alkaline uh, and PEM electrolyzers as well as PEM fuel cells. And then we've also made some other acquisitions and have uh, done some JVs uh, such as the one with Mprox to um, continue developing uh, compressed hydrogen storage tanks. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of our product portfolio, as I mentioned in the last slide, we develop both alkaline and PEM electrolyzers. So in the top row, you can see the names of our products. The high stat products are the alkaline electrolyzers and the high lysers are the PEM electrolyzers. The numbers that you see are the first one is the um, nominal hydrogen flow of the electrolyzer, followed by the output pressure of the electrolyzer. So from the high stat 15 to the highlyzer 500, these are turnkey applications, turnkey solutions, uh, both for indoor and outdoor applications. Turnkey means that these products are designed so that all you need to do is to connect them to a water supply and an electricity supply, and then you produce hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, so the highlyzer 200 is the one that has been installed at Flex and Kung Fu. And uh, so uh, just to give you um, an idea about the uh, product we've installed at Flex and Kung Fu, um, next slide, please. Um, it's the Highlyzer 200. It has one cell stack with a nominal input power of one megawatt, which means that it produces around uh, 18 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. Uh, what you see here is just uh, the, ele the electrolyzer with the balance of, of stack and the water polishing system. Uh, the actual turnkey solution includes two containers, which will be shown in the following slide. But as uh, Paula mentioned, the electrolyzer takes the energy from the power plant, produces hydrogen, which then gets fed into the um, gas turbine. So um, back to the slide, the previous slide, in terms of the product itself, uh, I'll show you a more detailed image. So as I mentioned, it comes in two containers. One container is the electrolyzer itself, and the other one is all the uh, electrical equipment. So the um, transformer, the rectifier to convert the current from uh, AC, sorry, uh, AC to DC, and then the cooling tower. Um, so as you can see, the most of our electrolyzers are modular, which means that you can either increase the amount of cells in the cell stack or add an additional cell stack to produce more hydrogen. Uh, as you can see in the following slide, uh, you can get an inside view of the electrolyzer. Um, so, uh, yeah, in the case of, of the cell set of the electrolyzer we installed in for uh, Flex and Kofu, it's only one cell stack. But this just gives you an idea of what a PEM electrolyzer looks like. And uh, the reason we installed the PEM electrolyzer, and I will speak about this in the following slide, is because compared to alkaline technology, uh, PEM gives you the ability to operate the electrolyzer at more, a more dynamic range. That means that you can manage the input elect of electricity that's going into the electrolyzer, which then uh, helps you to manage the amount of hydrogen that's being produced. We think that this is a particularly attractive technology, even though we've been working with alkaline electrolyzers since the 80s, because we think 
it better fits um, the output uh, electricity of renewable energy, which can vary depending on the day, uh, the season. Um, and yeah, so in the next slide, I will now dive into uh, uh, some other references or places that we've installed uh, the Highlyzer product. So it's been used for different applications such as power to gas, power to power and power to fuels. In the case of Flex and Kumpu, we have a power to power um, application. But just to give you an idea of some of the different products and places where we have been deploying our products, uh, so you're aware that this is not just the only time that we have uh, deployed our product. Um, and next slide, please. So in terms of the future and our technology roadmap, uh, Cummins is looking to essentially expand the capacity of the electrolyzer to double the input power and the hydrogen flow. So we have developed the Highlyzer 1000, which will be um, in the next slide, but do not uh, go there yet. So what we've done is that we've increased or doubled uh, the cell stack by adding cells. Hence, you see the increase in size. Uh, so in the Highlyzer 200, you have the one comma well, the one megawatt cell stack. Um, so we've taken that and we've uh, doubled it essentially. Uh, we've done this because essentially by increasing scale, uh, doubling the scale, you don't necessarily double the cost. Um, as you increase scale, the cost essentially decreases. decreases. Um, so we believe that uh, this way it will become more affordable to produce hydrogen. Then, as I mentioned before, in PEM electrolysis, you have more dynamic operation. Another benefit is it's very compact, uh, especially us as a company. We have the lowest footprint on the market in terms of the cell stack itself. And additionally, most importantly, um, PEM, electro PEM electrolyzers uh, have the advantage of uh, requiring reduced maintenance. Um, so uh, in the next slide, you will see the Highlyzer 1000, which is the product that we are currently installing in Bekancur, Canada. We are installing four Highlyzer 1000s. Um, each one has a nominal input power of um, five megawatts. So it's a 20 megawatt facility. It's currently being commissioned. So you can expect some updates within the following weeks. Uh, these, this specific application is only for indoor use. And, and in the future uh, for applications, power plant applications, we would be seeking to employ this product rather than the Highlyzer 200 that was previously shown. In this case, uh, with these larger electrolyzers, we work with EPC companies to do everything that includes the balance of plant. Uh, so in, in even more future development, we're looking to again double the size of the electrolyzer by increasing the surface area of the cells. So instead of going up, we are just widening the cell stack. Um, and we're looking to develop the Highlyzer 4000. So that would mean that you have uh, electrolyzer with four or five uh, megawatt cell stacks. And in the next slide, which is my final slide of my presentation, I just wanted to show you what the Beckoncore facility looks like. Um, so as I said, it's four Highlyzer 1000s, 20 megawatts. Um, we provide the electrolyzer and the rectifier, the squares that you can see filled in in red, and everything that's in kind of light reddish uh, is what the EPC provides. Um, so once this whole facility is up and running, uh, we would be producing about 8,000 kilograms of hydrogen per day. And yeah, that that's uh, my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Um, for tuning in and if you wish to contact me or reach me in the future, my contact information is in the following slide. Um, thank you for having me and for listening to my presentation. Great, thank you very much Leopold. And thank you all the presenters too for the very fruitful presentations. It was very informative. Since we have, we are a little bit uh, uh, running out of uh, the, the the schedule programs, uh, we'll go directly to the um, roundtable. But before of that, I just want to mention that if you want to know more information about Flex and Kung Fu, you could reach us or going directly to the site that is flexandkungfu.eu to have more information. Now 
let's go to the roundtable. And uh, first, uh, first, let me explain why we have this topic. So one of uh, ADP's news uh, main task on Flex and Kung Fu is to find out, to research, to benchmark other off takers and other users for the hydrogen produce at Ribatej, but also uh, uh, for hydrogen in general. So this uh, webinar is very important for us because it is uh, a milestone that uh, signals the, um, the kick off of this activity for us inside the project. Uh, now let's introduce the panel. So we have three keynote speakers. I will first introduce Pedro Furtado from REN, which has a background as a mechanical engineer in applied thermodynamics and fluid dynamics by Instituto Superior Técnico. Uh, Pedro is now head of uh, uh, REN Regulatory Affairs and Statistics. Uh, then we'll have Luis Reis uh, from SEIA that has a degree in chemical engineering and uh, master's in engineering and technology management from Instituto Superior Técnico and is now business development manager for mobility at SEIA. And George Souza from Lind. Uh, that is a mechanical engineer graduated at EST and uh, uh, since uh, November 2019 uh, being performing uh, function as a sales manager for industrial gases and hospital care Portugal. So here we have representatives from different off takers. So we have the natural gas grid. We also have mobility and Lind being a global player with uh, and presented in different parts of the value chain. Uh, we'll also focus on the other use that is the, the industry. So I begin with you, Pedro. Um, so a first question. The, ah, before of that, in very important, please, uh, you could ask questions, just put on the Q&A. And after this first round of questions from my side, then we'll go to the audience questions. So, Pedro, uh, a first one from my side. So, the current infrastructures that we have available for natural gas, so for receiving, storing, transporting, and distributing natural gas, will play a fundamental role in allowing the introduction, distribution, and consumption of hydrogen in the various sectors of the economy allowing to achieve higher levels higher levels of incorporation of renewable sources so in your view what will be the main challenges for the injection of hydrogen on the national gas grid well uh, thank you first and foremost for this opportunity to be with you and share our thoughts and uh, congratulations for this initiative and to all the panel members uh, as a TSO, REN operates both the electrical high voltage network as the high pressure network. And this gives us a, a, a very good idea of how to deal with this issue of hydrogen and the future that lies beyond it. I would say that first and foremost, we need clear government policy definitions. And this has been achieved by the by by the government making public the new gas law and the hydrogen uh, roadmap and bearing on this we need then to build what we call the technical constraints that have to be tackled first the physical network has to be certified we have still uh, uh, pipelines so we need to find uh, the, the, the proper processes to modify everything that is required in our network. And what is required? First, we need a compliance program to try to check how is our pipeline and how it will become once it, it, it gets exposed to higher concentrations of hydrogen. What are the consequences? We know what are the consequences, but they, they have to be planned, measured, and, and uh, be sure that everything is taken care of. So we need to do some stress control, try to evaluate what's going to happen, and also ver verify what are you going to do, for instance, in uh, units like the underground storage. 
Adogen is presently able to be stored in salt caverns. It's usual to do that, but we need to verify how our equipment is going to match these concentrations, these growing co concentrations of hydrogen. Another important, so in terms of, of technical issues, we have to, we have already launched a major program to uh, make everything ready in anticipation to the goals of the government, of course. Regarding uh, other things on a technical matter, we need to be careful about the injection points. Everybody will want to probably inject hydrogen in the network, and this has to, to be uh, defined in a clear way by proper technical regulations that will help people to understand what are the, the, the limitations. STSOs and, gas T and as gas TSOs, we favor very much the mixing of hydrogen and natural gas as a solution. We don't have, we, as a small country as Portugal is, we cannot afford to build from scratch a new pipeline just for hydrogen. Pipelines, the pipeline business is made of volumes and only if you have the right volumes, you can make them cheap enough for people to use them. So we need to be extremely careful. We are not Germany, we are not Holland, we are Portugal. And we need to be careful with that. So I think this was a very good option also from the government to say that uh, to mix hydrogen and natural gas is a stepping stone to start what? To start to give the distributed ge generation of hydrogen and also the centralized generation of hydrogen, the possibility to kickstart the businesses and try to improve the efficiency of the whole value chain. So on a technical point of view, we need to embrace the discussion of how much and where and when to, to inject. And people have to bear in mind that the pipelines have variable flow too. But we believe that it's possible to think about the pipeline as a dynamic storage provided we are injecting hydrogen within the window that uh, uh, the natural gas has for the wove index. So I think there's plenty of things to, to do there and positive things too. Of course, we need also to change our own way, uh, still on the, on the technical point of view, how we deal with the system management pr procedures and all the uh, uh, technical things we need to do in our pipelines, the hot tapping procedures, the welding procedures, the supervisory system. We need to change the, the chromatographs, but this is only, th th this is all technically feasible and uh, we are working on that so we can be other than ready as soon as possible. Another point that has to be tackled is market and regulatory. We need to launch clear ways to, for people to inject hydrogen in the system and how, who will buy this hydrogen, at what price, what is the, 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 the final price we will have. The government has already set uh, some guidelines and we believe that this is the solution. The government is uh, uh, trying to get the most of the competition that's going to happen between different players to get the best price and to say that until 2030 the price of hydrogen has to evolve in order to make it uh, cost compatible in a way with uh, gas. But I would say that uh, it's also important to understand that uh, in the long run we are facing a future with electricity and decarbonized fuels or gases. So it's in this framework that we should look to hydrogen, not directly as a competitor to gas, but more as a complement to the use of electricity in those uses that electricity by itself cannot provide a market solution that is viable. So we, are, we favor also that the market should be set to define the route forward. Once this is settled, we need to give time for the market to develop and try to understand what the technology will give us. And even there, we can identify in the strategy the government has published 
that is still room for the next 10 years to try to find out what will be the evolution based on technology and market that will probably lead this to a more cost efficient solution and give a room for and, and the playing field for the several players to get into this uh, process and, and uh, in take advantage of the fact that we are a, a, a small country with a, a very strong and robust pipeline system that can serve the H2 market. And in the end, we also need uh, some the green certificates. So we need to value the green hydrogen. The green hydrogen is a premium product. We can use it in a different way because we believe that we have the conditions in Portugal to produce the hydrogen at uh, uh, a competitive price that we can afford to use it for burning uh, at, 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 at the reasonable price. In, in, in Holland, for instance, or in Germany, they'll try to use the hydrogen, which is, will become probably more expensive being produced there, in, 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 in more premium uh, um, uses. But uh, we believe that in Portugal, we can beat this conundrum and allow hydrogen to become really part of the natural gas offer and to develop this market in a positive way. OK, thank you, Pedro. A very insightful perspective. Now going to Luis. Um, so focusing now on the mobility side, uh, we could look at the market and we could see different uh, road transport options. And what we are seeing is that the EVs or the electrical vehicles are taking over the market, at least for these light duty vehicles. Uh, my question is, will there be a space for the green hydrogen? And in which, if yes, in which segments it will be more relevant? Sorry, Luis, you are muted. I'm yes. muted, so I need to go back. Yes, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Thank, you all. Thank you for your question. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a very interesting discussion. Uh, in fact, uh, every uh, uh, we are very we are all mobilized towards decarbonization of the economy, decarbonization of of the different sectors, and transportation is a very is a very good example. Well, uh, uh, no, no, I'd say we believe that uh, mobility is uh, um, essentially uh, um, evolving towards zero carbon mobility or zero emissions mobility, building on uh, uh, new technologies, connectivity, autonomous driving, etc. We believe that cars, there will be a time when cars, and we are engaging in such projects when cars will be able to fly, crossing horizontal mobility with uh, vertical with vertical mobility. That they will that we will evolve towards new uh, ways of using the vehicles, and the vehicle is no longer a product; is essentially a, an enabler of these new services. And the energy, of course, and uh, all all the issues related to energy, to to, uh, to 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 the impact, must be understood throughout all the the uh, all the all, all the value chain. Of course. Uh, hydrogen will play a role in in mobility as it plays in different sectors, and it's uh, a crucial, crucial in this uh, evolution towards zero emissions mobility. Of course, uh, um, hydrogen is not uh, a, a source of energy; is more uh, transportation and storage vector of energy, and uh, essentially, an hydrogen powered vehicle or is uh, an electric vehicle that is fueled, that is fueled by hydrogen that is stored, that is uh, uh, stored on board. And in fact, there are, there are, there are, uh, there have been uh, tremendous developments in the, in the electric vehicle market. Um, just to give you a, a few numbers, just in 2019, there were more than 2 million electric vehicles sold worldwide, and there was something like 7,500 fuel cell vehicles sold. So this uh, this uh, gives us gives us a perspective of the level of maturity and the level of uh, 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 practic practicality that uh, distinguishes between the application of an electric vehicle and uh, an hydrogen an hydrogen powered uh, vehicle. 
um, this is pretty much been been fueled by uh, very significant developments in in batteries. Uh, we have had uh, uh, there was a, 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 an increase in uh, uh, efficiency uh, in auto, in in uh, in battery technologies around 80, 80 to ninety percent. So uh, today we are able uh, the, there was an, an increase uh, the decrease in cost around 80 to 90 percent. So today the cost of a kilowatt hour is uh, from something from one fifth to one tenth of what it was just 10 years ago. And uh, at the same time, there has been uh, some development in terms of the technologies and the, the, the capacity, the, the density. So we are able to, to uh, store more energy in less uh, uh, in less weight and less volume. So this is uh, um, this is big, this is has made uh, ele the electric vehicle very viable and a part of our day to day or, or of our day to day. And then, on a broader perspective, we have a very uh, dramatic difference in terms of the overall efficiency when we speak about energy. So we have an overall e efficiency from well to wheel from 70 to 90 percent, something like that. If we get green green energy to fuel the vehicle, uh, we 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 distribute it with a, a very high efficiency, and then we use it to power the the engine with the batteries. And uh, uh, if we talk about the life cycle of the of the or the well to wheel of the hydrogen, we are around one third of that value, around 25 to 30 percent. So this means that uh, uh, for the mass transportation, for the massive use of vehicles, uh, I would say that electric vehicles are uh, ir irreversible and unavoidable. Um, and uh, um, furthermore, uh, most of the transportation uh, problems or challenges that we face today are concentrated in cities. And in cities, uh, what we see today from our perspective at SAIA is that there is a, there is a need to uh, uh, provide new vehicles, smaller, lighter, lower impact vehicles that can essentially provide most of the services that enable people to move around or that enable the transportation of goods. And these vehicles will be essentially battery powered electric, battery powered electric vehicles. So where is the, where is the fit for the hydrogen? Where we see, we see the fit in uh, mostly in medium to long distance transportation of goods. Uh, uh, it's virtually impossible to consider uh, uh, long term long haul logistics based on on batteries just to give you an example if we uh, uh, take a bus if we take a, 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 a truck that uh, has a consumption around 100 kilowatts kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers and we need to provide the battery so that it uh, so that the truck can uh, uh, um, travel 500 kilometers we would be talking about having two to three uh, tons of the of weight to the vehicle uh, uh, just to be able to uh, perform this distance and it will and the vehicle will have to charge over several hours so uh, those kinds of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, applications like long haul logistics suburban buses um, critical functions where uh, uh, it's absolutely critical to keep vehicles move, moving those will be uh, uh, most of those will be uh, for certain uh, very good uh, uh, applications for hydrogen uh, in transportation. Of course, for that to happen, we still face significant challenges. Uh, one challenge is the maturity, uh, maturity of the technology, not, all, not, long, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of power density and, uh, and capacity. And on the other hand, the issue re re regarding infrastructure. So, uh, um, if in on the one hand, the use of hydrogen uh, on uh, vehicles could somehow replicate the experience that we have today with our car, with a conventional vehicle. That is, you pump gas and you in five ten minutes you're ready to go. There is no capillarity, and there is still uh, uh, um, a huge uh, investment cost. Uh, in terms of rolling out the first generation, the first generation of of, uh, of infrastructure. Of course, just to finish, um, uh, transportation is a very important 
uh, sector when we address this transformation in uh, energy vectors or in energy uh, uh, solutions because this is an area where we have a strong industry and when we address this transformation moving towards electrification moving towards hydrogen as a vector for energy it is also important for us to understand that we have a, 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 an automotive industry that we have a, a bus industry uh, that we have uh, uh, different sectors that cross these industries where it is important to somehow connect the dots between what is electrifying uh, the, uh, the, uh, our energy uh, uh, our portfolio or generating good uh, uh, solutions that so that we have hydrogen ready for sectors like transportation and on the other side uh, giving some sort of integration with the ability to generate good industrial projects around the technologies that would enable uh, the use of these uh, uh, of these uh, energy sources or these energy vectors in these sectors. Okay, thank you very much, Luis. Now moving to George. Uh, so now focusing more on the other types of uh, uses, the most promising use cases we have seen uh, that uh, for hydrogen. Uh, could be to use hydrogen as a feedstock, uh, gas for chemical chains and refining, and has a fuel for direct combustion in um, industries like steel and glass. So my question is, what are the main challenges for the adoption of H2 on those processes? And also, if you want uh, from your side to provide an overview of lean activities and the position on the value chain, uh, feel free. George. Hello, no, no. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation and congratulations for the event. Really interesting. OK, most uh, maybe some of you know Linde. Linde is a world leading gas and engineering company present in more than 100 countries uh, dealing with gases, industrial gases, medical gases and hydrogen uh, since many years. So we have customers in the industry, several segments from uh, uh, refining, petrochemical, uh, food industry, uh, manufacturing, metallurgy, for combustion, whatever. Uh, and we are dealing with that since many years. The challenge uh, that we see now uh, is that this carbonization, uh, we see that, that trend uh, clearly. And we are seeing several projects coming in the steel mills in the, in the refining as well, not only in Portugal, but worldwide and Europe. That's a, a topic. Um, and uh, yeah, we are looking to solutions like uh, burners, combustion systems, how to supply it more effectively. You know, hydrogen is a problem. Uh, we can supply it uh, compressed, uh, but it's well. Uh, difficult, quite heavy to, to we are moving 140 tons of truck to, to supply 30, 300 kilos of hydrogen. We could liquefy it, we could inject in a natural gas grid, which is one of the solutions uh, most likely. Uh, but I think the most challenge or the biggest challenge is to scale up. Uh, we are used to the industry, so small to medium amounts of hydrogen needs. Uh, we can handle that, no problem. Uh, the problem is to, to uh, deliver the huge quantities that uh, the market will, will require. Uh, that, from my point of view, the, the biggest challenge. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, let me see if we have questions from the audience. Will Chandler? Have one, right? OK, so uh, we have one question that is, so it seems hydrogen will mostly be a premium product for some industries, also because of the price and the green certificates, but will not be significantly replace the existing solutions. So what are the H2 main advantages? So important question uh, from our uh, speakers the the panel who wants to to answer this maybe uh, Pedro for us I, I could start well this is only the the beginning I didn't say it was not a solution I, 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 I have to stress that this is a first step because nobody knows really what the future will be 
for instance, if the designated turquoise uh, hydrogen comes in, into play, which is a way to remove carbon directly from methane and deliver this, for instance, at the GRMS level to the distribution networks, we could have 100% low cost hydrogen totally de delivered to the distribution networks directly to both industries and, and households uh, at a very competitive price. So nobody really knows what will be the future. I, th I, I think it's fundamental to use this next 10 years to prepare the future and to make the choices because we need to get them ready in the next five years in order to know where to go and what will happen. But I am sure that the future will definitely be 100% hydrogen and electricity. And I have to stress another thing. It's much cheaper to transport a certain amount of energy by pipeline than to do it, do it through, through transmission lines. The cost difference is probably 10 to 12 times. So it means that there are applications. I'm going, the future is also, it will be more electric, definitely. But there's room for these applications and to see that uh, the actual cost of hydrogen is going down. For instance, SNAM president, it's not me who said that, said that if they pr produce the hydrogen in, in, in uh, uh, Tunisia, they can get uh, two euros per kilo. This is below 40 euros per megawatt hour. Can you imagine this? It could be delivered at a fraction of the cost to the final client. So I think we are on, 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 on the new era. We are starting. Nobody really knows what the future will be, but we have to be future proof. All right, thank you, Pedro. I don't know if the other two uh, speakers want to, to comment on this. Yeah, yeah, just a brief comment is that hydrogen seems most probably the most viable solution in order to, in order to achieve zero emissions transportation in the in the use cases that we discussed, namely uh, long haul uh, um, logistics or another area in which which we haven't talked yet uh, talked about, which is uh, either or two areas which are maritime traffic and uh, um, aircraft, where it also seems uh, very, very promising. OK, thank you, Luis. Um, Josh, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, the, yeah uh, I think it will play a huge role in the decarbonization. Just look into a steel mill, for instance, uh, to use uh, green hydrogen as a fuel for the heating furnaces or in a refinery replacing the semi farming burning uh, natural gas, for instance. Uh, that's the way, I believe. OK, thank you. Uh, since we are uh, reaching one hour and 30, uh, I just want to conclude this uh, by uh, because I saw that we have still one question, but it's from the Flex and Kofu uh, project. I want to address this maybe to Paula or Paul. Um, so the question is, as I understood, 1% of hydrogen will be tested to be injected into the gas turbine in Ribatej for this pilot project. In this scenario, the majority of fuel in natural gas, not hydrogen, being burned in the uh, power to H to power use case. So two questions. Uh, do you think it is possible that the gas plant will be able to be retrofitted and run on 100% uh, hydrogen in the future? That is the first one. And the second one, what will be the retrofit design requirements for this pure H2P use case? Paula, so. Okay. You're on your side. I can. I can. I can answer. Uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, retrofit for uh, um, retrofit for if we are we are talking about retrofit of 100% of existing combined cycle power plant, this uh, uh, will imply several and deep uh, changes. In not only uh, we are talking not only in combustion chamber and in the control system. 
but also uh, it boilers. Now the boilers don't have bypass, so we need also to have uh, to 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 need major modifications in the in the panels of the boilers. So uh, we 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 need also a NOx emission control system. Uh, so it it will be uh, almost uh, a new system. So I, I think that these retrofit for the existing uh, combined cycle power plants for this high level 100%, uh, I think it is not viable in terms of cost effective. So uh, I think that this uh, um, uh, could be an interesting uh, solution for a transition scenario that uh, has where we are. So with low passengers, I think it is possible uh, for passengers until, until 30 uh, 30 percent. So, uh, changing the combustion chamber, uh, putting a SCR system. So, I think Mitsubishi are, are already developing some uh, some systems uh, because uh, you know when we burn um, hydrogen, the the NOx emission will increase. Uh, so we have to control the NOx uh, the NOx emissions with the most uh, advanced systems then only to control the temperature. So um, I think this this is good for the scenario for transition uh, for uh, 30 to no, no, almost no, no, then 50. But for 100%, I think that should be uh, dedicated, uh, more dedicated uh, uh, gas turbines that will are able uh, uh, from the beginning to uh, adequate uh, system with computer chamber, NOx emission control to burn 100% uh, hydrogen. It's my opinion. Okay, thank you very much, Paula. Okay. So we reached one hour in 30, so we are at the end of our webinar. I just have to thank all of you to, particip uh, to participating on this, the audience to be on that side. Uh, listening to this very fruitful discussion to my panel of experts to provide their views. It was very useful uh, and we already gather uh, good knowledge to feed in on this task that we have on the Flex and Kofu and we will reach you again for asking for more input for that task about other uses. So thank you all. I think uh, now I have to, yeah, to pass the word to you, Alexander. Yeah, thank you very much, Nuno. Uh, thank you to all our our invited speakers, and thank you to to the audience for for being there. Um, I want to just to remind that uh, our next session will probably take place in uh, the 16th of, of December, uh, and will will be about um, the ocean energy. Uh, the ocean energy projects that we are carrying on, and so uh, stay, stay, uh, keep attention on the on our um, social networks, and we'll we'll communicate about this next session. And uh, thank you very much again to, for for being there, and see you next time. <music>